The Lord be with you. Pat, I know I've said this before, but you keep it up, you'll be you'll do pretty good. You know that. Pat and I were, uh, as you turn in your Bibles to the 35th chapter of Isaiah, Pat and I were discussing, you know, maybe him just preaching this service, and man, you sort of did. So, so thank you, thank you, brother. Isaiah chapter 35 is where we'll be on this third Sunday of Advent. The Sunday we mark with the theme of joy. Isaiah chapter 35, we'll read all ten verses there. Isaiah chapter 35, verse 1 reads like this. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Strengthen the weak hands. Make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who are of a fearful heart, Be strong, do not fear. Here is your God. He will come with vengeance, with terrible recompense. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the speechless sing for joy. For water shall break forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert The burning sand shall become a pool, and the thirsty ground springs of water. The haunt of jackals shall become a swamp. The grass shall become reeds and rushes. A highway shall be there, and it shall be called the holy way. The unclean shall not travel on it, but it shall be for God's people. No traveler, not even fools, shall go astray. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast come upon it. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads, and they shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, help us through these words of Scripture to hear what you would have us to hear. Lord, that we may listen to your voice calling us to do what you would have us to do. That we may be empowered to be the people you call us to be. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, by now, most of you, if not all of you, have your Christmas trees up. Maybe your nativity's out, the snowmen inflated on the front lawn, lights strung up on the porch, and stockings hung either by the chimney with care or around the TV, or like at my house, at my dad's place, just stuck on the wall with some thumbtacks. You've been listening to songs like Jingle Bells and Frosty the Snowman for at least a few days, and you've probably already watched Christmas Vacation, Elf, Miracle on 34th Street, uh, some adaptation of Dickens' A Christmas Carol, which my favorite is the Muppets version. Um, And maybe if you're one of the elite and wise among us, you have already seen what is my personal and forever favorite Christmas classic, which the year it came out, I'm sure, was robbed of all of the Oscars. Uh, Ernest Saves Christmas. You may have already gone to company Christmas parties, or tacky sweater parties, or white elephant parties, or Yankee swap parties, or whatever other kind of parties there are. Maybe you've already eaten your weight in white fudge Oreos, and sausage balls, all kinds of dips, and cheese balls, and all sorts of things that shouldn't be peppermint flavored but are. Well, I bet some of you even maybe right now still have the, the smell of hot cider on your breath, or maybe in your front pocket what's left of a candy cane you started eating in Sunday school. It's December 11th, the third Sunday of Advent, but everywhere you look, everywhere you listen, it seems to already be Christmas. Now when did that happen? 
I mean, can you look back, somebody, if you've got a calendar or a phone that goes back that far, can somebody find out what year did Christmas begin to just suddenly show up? I mean, when I was a kid, it felt like Christmas took forever and a day to come. I mean, I was pretty young. I feel like I've known the expression, slowest Christmas, my whole life. I knew what it was when I was a kid. Every year, it felt like the days between when school started in August and December 25th were not 24-hour days, but 2,400-hour days. They just got longer and longer. And when the calendar flipped to December, they got even more long. I remember all that excitement. All that anticipation, all that wishing that Christmas Day would just get here. That if it was November 12th, that I would just shut my eyes and the next time I opened them, it would be Christmas. Of course, every Christmas was always a little sort of anticlimactic. I mean, the day would arrive, I'd get up early, I'd open presents, change out of my sleeping clothes, get in the car, and head either over to my dad's house, or if I woke up at dad's house, head over to my mom's house. From there, we would uh, travel to my, one of my grandmother's houses where we would eat dinner and swap presents, and at some point in the afternoon, we'd decide we'd all have enough of looking at one another, and so we'd all load back up in the car and go either to my aunt's house or we'd go to some other relative's house or some uh, uh, grandmother I didn't know I had on some other side of the family somewhere, but we had to go over there because we didn't go last year, you know, that kind of thing. And eventually, when we all wound up back home, it was dark. The day was gone. All that waiting, all that longing, all that anticipation, and it was over. Just like that, over. And it all just felt a little bit underwhelming. It's sort of that way as an adult, too, I suppose. Because, you know, we place a lot of pressure on Christmas Day, on shopping for gifts for people we know that don't need a single thing, but we got to get them something. And so we look online now. We, we go to Black Friday sales that happen on Wednesdays. That doesn't even make sense. We start shopping for things for people who don't need things. We attend parties, programs, functions, and events that have more to do with obligation and habit. Oh, well, we got to go. Got to be there. Everybody's going to be. We got to go. And it does the celebration and joy. We put all this pressure on trying new recipes. Oh, I found this thing now. It's, it's for peppermint apple, apple cider. Nobody's had it. I can't wait to make it. We're going to see how it turns out. Or perfecting old ones. I got grandma's uh, sweet potato pie recipe, and everybody's going to talk about it for the rest of the year. That's what we do. Am I wearing the right clothes? Is it going to snow? I know we live in Alabama. But don't you wake up every December 25th just crossing your face? It's 85 degrees outside. You've turned the AC on. <laughs> but you're just hoping, hoping maybe, maybe this time Span got it wrong. And it's going to snow. The season becomes all about that one day. And we pile so much expectation upon it that when it comes, we sort of collapse under it all. Especially when it doesn't turn out the way we want it. Or when it's all over. And we realize we put so much work into something that took so long to get here, but it's over in the blink of an eye. When we celebrate Christmas this way, there may be some joy, but it's usually just for a day. And then it's on to whatever's next on the calendar. Where are we having the New Year's party? What are we doing President's Day? When are we gonna where when are we gonna do our summer vacation? Just on to the next thing. That's why I like to celebrate the season of Advent. Advent forces us to wait, to live with that anticipation, to live with that tension, that hope. It forces us to look forward without looking over what's right in front of us. In the recognition of Advent, there's a necessity to not solely focus on the destination, but to find joy in the journey, in the waiting, in the meantime. Because in Advent, it can't just be about the gifts. It can't just be about schedules and parties and presents and dinners and dates on the calendar. It's about marking time, lighting of candles, the recognition of themes like hope, peace, and as we reflect today, joy, and next week, love. By marking the, the time with the recognition of Advent, December 25th, 
becomes a day that we're prepared for. It's a day we've not just put on the calendar and circle and say, boy, I hope everything goes right on that day. But we've sort of inched our way to it. It becomes a day for which we were prepared. A day whose meaning isn't lost in wrapping paper and shuffling between parents' houses. When we focus only on the day, as many tend to do outside of the tradition of Advent or really outside of a faith tradition, there may be joy for that day, but when we embark on the journey of Advent, there's joy along the way. Joy that prepares our hearts, our minds, and our spirit for that ultimate joy of that day to which we most look forward. But let's be honest. Finding joy on the journey isn't always easy. After all, a journey takes time, and the time requires patience. And while we sing about peace on earth, and while we sing about goodwill towards men, let them cut in front of me at Target. See what happens. That's what we think, right? We sing about peace on earth, and then we drive down to the exchange, and we, can't, we have to sit through four red lights before we can get in there. We sing about it, but patience doesn't really come so easily. Even the smoothest road can become monotonous. The most luxurious car seat can begin to feel hard and uncomfortable when one's posterior has occupied it for hours on end. The straightest highways inevitably become crowded with traffic. When there's the slightest accident, a little bit of road work, a rush hour in the city. There are many people we meet on journeys that cause confusion. People who seem to like slowing others down or messing folks up. It isn't always easy to find joy on the journey. And I think that's why we, we become so preoccupied with just the destination. Whether it's Christmas Day, a vacation spot, or whether we've been uh, gone away from home for so long and all we can think about is our bed and getting home. I think that's why. You know, by the second half of the 6th century B.C., the people of Judah could only dream about home, a destination for which they had long since they were exiled by, by the emperor Nebuchadnezzar around the year 586. Jerusalem, the city, had been destroyed. The temple was looted, razed, and now those who had once sat in comfort in their own homes in Judah had little more than the hopes, visions, and dreams of prophets. Crazy, some of them, like Ezekiel, who would roll around on the ground and tell people, this is what it's going to be like, and everyone goes, he's crazy. Who would, who would burn dung and cook his meals on it and say, this is what it's going to be like, and everybody goes, I don't know what's wrong with him. But one's like Isaiah. The third Isaiah. But while they're sitting in Babylon, along come the Persians. And when the Persians conquered Babylon, their king Cyrus told the exiles they could go back to Jerusalem. In fact, the same Isaiah who wrote the passage we read this morning calls Cyrus God's Mashiach, God's Messiah. He releases the captives to go back. No doubt the journey seemed long, dangerous, and there were likely those who would just rather stay put. I mean, can't you hear it? Oh, hey, hey, honey, the king said we can go back to Judah. Really? I just unpacked the last box. Really, the kids are settled in their school? Really? I mean, this place is a little nicer than the one we had back then, but maybe it's Judah. I don't know. I don't know. I can see it. It was out of this atmosphere of hesitant hope that another prophet in the line of Isaiah arose. Scholars sometimes call this prophet Titro Isaiah or third Isaiah. There are at least three Isaiahs, a pre-exilic, exilic, and post-exilic. His prophetic career took place right there at the end of the exile, just before the captives would return to Judah with Ezra and Nehemiah to rebuild their city and their temple. And in the text before us, this prophet Isaiah talks about some really kind of wild stuff, doesn't he? Blossoming deserts that shall rejoice with singing. The strengthening of weak hands, the firming of feeble knees, the encouragement of the fearful, sight given back to the blind, the unstopping of deaf ears, the leaping like deer of those who were once lame, waters flowing in a once parched desert. 
It's an image of a rough way made smooth, a dangerous direction made safe, a wide wasteland made navigable by a grand holy highway leading to the very place they'd all want to go. It's a vision of safety, a vision of hope, a vision of joy. As it describes a highway free of those who are unclean, a path void of the dangers that were once typical of such places in the wilderness. It's a vision, not of the destination. Did you notice that? Isaiah doesn't say, oh, when we get there, there's milk and honey and the cedars of Lebanon and gold and temples and all this great stuff. No, it's the vision of the destination. I mean, I'm sorry, of the journey. It's a vision of joy for the journey. If I'm honest with you, when I read this at first, I want it, I want it to be a passage about a stress-free journey. A stress-free journey that comes for those who are faithful, who obey God, who listen to what God has for us. Those of us who find ourselves listed among the ransomed and redeemed. I want to read these words about blossoming deserts and traffic-free highways as words that speak to the ease with which one might expect this life on the way to glory to be. I want to. I want this to be uh, words about the way being easy and smooth and about how you're not going to have to worry about anything, Chris. I want it to be words about how this highway is wide and straight and you don't have to worry. It's all laid out in front of you and all you got to do is walk. That's what I wanted to say. I want to believe that. I want to believe that the journey of faith is like my idealized Christmas morning. Full of joy, warm, fuzzy feelings, and yet somehow snow and without a care in the world. But I know, you know, that's not how it is. I know the journey of faith is more like the days leading up to Christmas. Oh, there are joyful times, joyful moments when we will experience the the joy and friendship, gathering with friends around good food or coming into this room and worshiping. But there are also those difficult days. Those days when the wind is too cold to keep the chill out of our bones. Those days when someone else's frustrations are turned upon us because we're easy targets. Those days when nothing goes our way. Those days when it just seems like the sun won't come out from the clouds and everyone else is piling their cloud on top of us over and over. Those days when all we want to do is go to bed. But there are dishes in the sink, and there are diapers that need to be changed, and there are things to do and work to be done, and so we press on. The journey, it seems, is always more complicated than the destination. It's even there in the words of the prophet in this poem. You might miss it if you read it too fast, but they're there. You see, the prophet speaks about a transformed desert, a holy highway, but he also talks about hands that need strengthening. Did you notice that? They don't just magically appear. He says, strengthen them. It's a command. Knees that are feeble, eyes that can't see, ears that can't hear. He makes commands of those traveling on this journey to help those who are otherwise handicapped, those with the weak hands and deaf ears. But that isn't always easy. How do we do that? What are we supposed to do? It implies that there are those on the journey who need help. Those who aren't necessarily fit or able to make the journey alone. And not only that, but the prophet says that on this highway God is paving, the unclean shall not travel on it. I suppose that's good news for some. After all, you don't want those kinds of folks slowing you down, getting in your way, them unclean folks. But really, the prophet is mentioning more like those who who would travel the road to the temple, not for worship, but those who were traveling to go trade, those who were passing through on military service, those who were unclean in their actions, not in who they were. But he also says, no traveler, not even fools, shall go astray. Now, now, that, that, that bit about fools... A bit about fools not going astray, that sounds great if you're a fool. But if you're one of the non-fools, it sounds frustrating. It sounds disappointing. After all, if a fool can't wander off, you know what that means? It means that fool's on the road with you. 
And that same fool might tend to swerve into your lane. Ride the brakes for 15 miles. Get behind you and ride the whole way with their high beams on. This journey, this journey isn't taken on a gravy train with biscuit wheels. In fact, you know what the prophet says? We have to walk. Walk? Some of y'all live half a mile from the church and you ain't going to walk up here. And here it says, you got to walk. The prophet says, the redeemed shall walk there. Already, already, you know what I can hear folks saying? You know, this place ain't that bad. Maybe we ought to just stay right here. Maybe, oh, I know, I know it sounds better on the other side, but to get there, we got to go through this stuff. Ah, oh, no, I, I, let's, just, let's just stay right here. And in some ways, I think that is exactly how this thing called faith works. It's a journey. Complete with ups and downs, with folks who need your help and folks who want to help you. It's a journey. It's a journey with those who will slow you down. Folks who are way, way on up the road from you and you go, how am I ever going to catch up to them? And folks who are way behind you and going, huh, they ain't never going to catch up to me. Only to have them pass you somewhere along the way. It's a journey. It's a journey you got to share with the fools who get in the way and cause confusion. Oh, yeah, there may not be the great dangers that others face who don't travel on this same journey, this same heavenly highway, but it's still a journey, complete with uncertainty and frustration, doubt and misdirection, the helpers and the helpless, the fools, the wise, the humble and the arrogant. It's a journey that requires us to want to take it. We're not just stuck on it like a grand conveyor and it just pushing us through life. We've got to want to take it. To want to leave where we are even now. Even though where we are may be safe, it may be comfortable, it may be certain. But faith, faith if anything, it's, it's more than a destination. Faith is the joy found in the journey. Because the Christian life, friends, is not only about finding joy in a hoped-for destination somewhere over in the sweet by and by. It's about finding joy in the journey now in spite of weak hands and feeble knees. In spite of fearful hearts, blind eyes, and deaf ears. It's about finding joy when the desert is dry or when water springs up from unexpected places. It's about finding joy when the highway is paved smooth and the travel is easy and where there are potholes and fools getting all in the way. That's why I think we need Advent. Why we need signposts along the journey to remind us of hope, of peace, of joy. We need to be reminded that the birth of Christ isn't just about some resting place on the other side of the grave. God came to be incarnate to show us that it's about the whole ball of wax, the whole thing. It's about finding joy in God's creation, about finding joy on this journey of faith. We may look forward to Christmas Day, but we need to be reminded of the ways in which Christ is born into our lives every single day. Just as we may look forward to the joys of heaven, but we may need to be reminded of the ways in which Christ is calling us to bring the joys of heaven here and now to make it a reality on this side of eternity. Perhaps this Advent we need to be reminded that just as Christmas isn't a single day, a destination on the calendar, the faith isn't just about a destination. Perhaps as much as we need to wait to prepare ourselves for the arrival of the Christ child on Christmas through the season of Advent, we need to wait to prepare ourselves for the arrival of God's kingdom through the days, weeks, months, and years of our lives on this journey we call faith. So may we take these precious few days we have leading up to Christmas and see in them the precious few days we have on this earth. Days we have to journey on in faith. And may we find in them the joy that comes from a faith lived out in flesh and blood. In hands and feet. A faith lived out in a crying child. 
a faith lived out by the way we bring the kingdom here and now. A faith lived out in this journey that we all share together. May we find joy this Advent for the journey. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, giver of the Holy Spirit and all good things. Lord, as we are here on this third Sunday of Advent, as we continue on the journey towards Christmas Day, as we continue on this journey of faith that you have given us, God, give us the courage to carry on. Give us hope, peace, just joy in this journey. Help us to see each day as the gift that it is, the gift that we live for you, another step on the way. So Holy Spirit, be with us now. Speak to us. That whatever we may be carrying this day on the journey, help us to share it with one another, to share it with you, that it may be for just a small way that we are reminded of the destination, reminded of the way we are to bring it here and now, even in the midst of the journey. Be with us, Holy Spirit, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.